Support for Conversations with Elle McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across the Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. Uh, organizations like Ainda Young Center. I'm pleased to have as a guest Deb Foster. She's the executive director of Ainda Young Center. Ainda Young is Ojibwe. It means our home. Uh, mm -hmm. And pleased to talk about uh, a new addition, an expansion of the work of Ainda Young. In fact, uh, announcing the uh, uh, opening this fall of Mino Oski, Ainda Young. The name means good new home. You are providing a home, an environment, an option, uh, a, a place for uh, addressing the phenomenon, the tragedy of homelessness among youth. You're focusing primarily on uh, young uh, people in the 18 to 24 year old range. And uh, your initiative is culturally responsive designed to assist our American Indian young people with a safe place for cultural healing and growth. Uh, among things, you provide uh, life skills training uh, and educational support, helping people become independent and self-sufficient. Uh, Deb Foster, thank you for being here. Let me just say that, uh, uh, talk about your education, your background. Uh, you've got a master's degree in marriage and family therapy, uh -huh. I think it is, right, from University of Wisconsin Stout and a bachelor's degree in special education and elementary education from University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. You've worked for 20 years in the field. You've, uh, more, more than that, yeah. At least 20, more yep. than that. But the work includes, uh, you know, development, program development uh, and management, fundraising for community uh, based nonprofit organizations, including serving as director of development and communication for the Minnesota Coalition for Battered Women, executive director for Lindale Neighborhood Association, and the membership and marketing director for YMCA. And you've been at the center, at Ainda Young Center, for uh, almost 10 years, nine and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned that a, a new home is almost a new expansion. It's coming mm -hmm. online. Uh, that's going to be a, a 42 unit building. Uh, you kind of end at the tail end of a, uh, a massive capital campaign. You're 98% uh, on target and complete with a $15 million uh, development initiative that plans to be open to the work in September of this year. Congratulations, first of all. Oh, thank and, you. And thank you for what you do. I want to start by talking about the vision, though. What is the vision of the organization? Why, why did it come into existence? And how difficult has it been, but how rewarding has it been to be there and to be present in the lives of the community? Um, well, the Ingda Young Center started back in the early 80s. Um, originally, there was um, the Red School mm -hmm. House, mm -hmm. um, which was one of the first American Indian uh, schools predominantly for uh, American Indian students um, in the 70s. And mm -hmm. so towards the end of the 70s, they discovered that the children were still struggling, even though they were getting great education and culturally responsive work. Um, and found out that the kids were homeless or they were with families that were homeless. And so they decided if we're going to truly assist our folks, then we need to make sure that they're housed. And so that uh, group of leaders uh, from the Native community uh, started the, brought the building on Portland and Lexington, mm -hmm. which is now our emergency shelter and our main headquarters. Um, and from there, over the years, um, we have just... Uh, Numerous groups of people over the years have just continued to respond to the needs of our families and young people. So, um, and we provide a safe place for healing and um, educational uh, goals and workforce support 
Um, we provide an emergency shelter for young 5 to 17 year olds. We also have a transitional living program for 16 to 22 year olds. Um, we also do family advocacy. We also provide uh, ICWA support for our families. We have an ICWA court monitor that goes into the Ramsey County courts and makes sure that ICWA is being abided, abided by. Um, we also provide legal services, children's mental health services, a lot of cultural teachings and experiences because mm -hmm. we know in our community in order for us to truly move beyond the historical trauma that lasted into the 80s and early 90s mm -hmm. um, that that reestablishing a sense of identity of who we are and who they are as young native people mm -hmm. is first and foremost mm -hmm. and so all of our work is geared around that. Let's talk about historical trauma. That's so important and to a degree I think society has wanted to ignore uh, mm -hmm. the, the existence and the impact of historical trauma. Society wanted to uh, turn and tell uh, Native people that uh, whatever problems you have are, are your personal problems. It's not anything right. that's cultural even or culture mm -hmm. is not part of this. It's your individual deficiency Correct. or failing, yes. but that's wrong. It is very wrong. And it's pernicious. Um, it's really yes. intentional wrongness damaging, and you are responding and addressing that. We are, as are many other agencies as well. Um, you know, people oftentimes think, well, the historical trauma was so long ago, get over it, kind mm -hmm. of a thing. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, is that the boarding school era uh, lasted into the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. and. And, in, and it was in 1978 that the Religious Freedom Act came to play. Um, and up until that point, it was illegal for us to even have powwows or to do our ceremonies or, or practice what we practice and uh, our teachings and traditions. Um, people were jailed, sometimes killed. Um, it was also in 1978 that the ICWA Child, Indian Child Welfare Act came to be. Up until that point, um, children were continuing to be ripped out of their families' right. homes, placed in other homes or in boarding schools, mm -hmm. um, not to mention all of the physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse that happened to our people. And so we have youth walking in our doors today that are being raised by grandparents and parents who uh, were potentially in the boarding school era, which was designed, of course, to strip everybody of their teachings, or mm -hmm. language, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so our young people are struggling with that sense of native identity, mm -hmm. or worse yet, they have a sense of negative identity. Mm -hmm. And so we see it every day, then our kids walk in our doors and with this new project that um, that healing and that cultural reestablishing that native identity, that positive pride, mm -hmm. and what it truly means mm -hmm. to be American Indian, mm -hmm. and how that just changes who they are mm -hmm. and their visions yes. and their hope. Yeah, yeah. And so that's why we do that first and then we move on to the other I suspect goals. that as you succeed in uh, um, uh, encouraging and nurturing that self-discovery, that discovery of identity mm -hmm. and the confidence that comes with that, not only are you healing that individual and his or her family and sort of uh, moving towards a sense, a certain restoration yes. uh, in the family, in the community. I suspect that uh, this process is part of the healing of the entire nation, that yes. America won't be healed until mm -hmm. there is healing in the American Indian community, until the, the we can't ignore right. the trauma, can't ignore being on either side of it as the perpetrators mm -hmm. or as the institutions that mm -hmm. allowed it and sustained it or ignored it. And so until we finally get to where uh, we both uh, uh, encourage and develop and nurture and elevate uh, the dignity that comes with uh, identity, uh, the country itself won't find where it's got to go. That's what I think. What do you think? Yeah, I, I actually really appreciate you bringing this up because I think it is... Um it's unfortunate that uh, the issues that we're seeing in our communities, mm -hmm. and, and granted the, the homelessness and youth homelessness in the state of Minnesota, 
uh, American Indians have the highest disparities. Mm -hmm. And uh, only two percent of the population lives. Yeah, in Minnesota, of the two percent, uh, if you look at the homeless youth arena, we're twenty-two percent of the yeah. homeless youth that are on our streets, mm -hmm. and that's just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, we are also for, unfortunately dealing with many other disparities, educational mm -hmm. and so forth, um, but it's because of the, the trauma that is still very, very, very present. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have an opportunity now with our young people to uh, help them turn that corner and mm -hmm. to reestablish um, who they are as young people and be able to move forward in a positive way. Mm -hmm and become future leaders and teachers of our language and teachers of our traditions and bring back, you know, we take kids to ceremonies and sun dances and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And so we're just uh, hoping that this will, and we know it will, it is going to provide a generation mm -hmm. of young people mm -hmm. that will be able to move this f even further for our communities. What, what do you think is going to be happening uh, at your new facility? What kinds of services, what additional things are you able to do yes. with the new facility coming online? And then I want you to mention, you know, you've got partners in community, some Absolutely. people that get it and people that stand up and show up and show up the right way with the right uh, resources and access. Uh, anything you want to say about that? You're Absolutely. To. Um, this is a partnership mm -hmm. uh, organization um, project. Um, starting with uh, some leaders from the community, but more importantly, young homeless youth. Mm -hmm. We're a big part of designing this vision and talking about what it is this building needed and where they wanted it, what they wanted it to look like, what they wanted it to include, is all a part of this project. Mm -hmm. And so they were very much leaders in that. Um, it is designed, as you said, for the 18 to 24 year olds because that's Kids are aging out of foster care at 18. Mm -hmm. They're losing all of their ben benefits for simply turning 18. Mm -hmm. They've exhausted their housing opportunities. Um, and so they're falling right back into homelessness mm -hmm. again. And so that is why we're focusing on this that age range. The entire building was built specifically for the teachings of our culture and traditions. Marvelous. So the external external part of the building is um, beautifully designed by DSGW and First Nations mm -hmm. um, design. Uh, Mike Lavendor, who is a, a native a architect, uh, also Loeffler, uh, native owned and woman owned, um, is a part of the construction. Um, and we're also uh, co-owners with uh, Project for Pride and Living, PPL, who mm -hmm. has done a lot of work in the American yep. Indian community yep. as well. Um, so, and then not to mention the fabulous management team at ADYC that have been a part of this. Also Fox Advancement has also been um, our, our a terrific team for us in the whole capital campaign. So yes, many, many partners who have come together. Our legislators have been super supportive of this, uh, Minnesota Housing, and, uh, and so we've been very fortunate and very blessed in that, in that respect. And so because of that, we are now building a building. It's done, like you said, due to open late September. Um, the lower level, uh, like I said, is going to be, is designed, has a cultural activities center designed specifically uh, to have sewing machines mm -hmm. and things like that so that young people can make their own regalia, they can do their beadwork. Um, there's another room specifically designed to soak hides so that our young people will be able to stretch hides and make their own drums. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have a food and, and clothing uh, room as well. We're also going to have uh, something like a credit store or a small uh, mini Walmart, mm -hmm. or I'm uh, not Walmart, but like a Walgreens, a CVS, yeah, sure. where kids can go and uh, purchase items mm -hmm. um, with Re vouchers. Retail operation. Yeah. And they can work there and, oh, wow. and gain some soft you know, work skills. First level is going to be offices. We're going to have a huge uh, training and cultural center. Um, there's also a workforce center. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of workforce training. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Oh, and the basement is also a fitness center. And then on every level, there's a, a circular uh, gathering center. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where we'll be doing a lot of the teachings mm -hmm. and, and of, of culture and history. There's also uh, teaching kitchens on each floor so we can mm -hmm. uh, teach uh, healthy cooking and living, not to mention gathering centers. And then in the green space on the outside, on one end, we're going to have a section for a sweat lodge. Uh -huh. 
and so we'll be able to have sweats right on site, which was be wonderful uh, and rare in the inner city. Mm -hmm. Also, a medicine garden, so youth will be able to plant our medicines mm -hmm. and harvest them in the fall, as as well as a water element. So yeah, all the, of the four all the teaching, elements on everything uh, being taught, taught teaching. and learned. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so once we uh, provide each youth with, uh, depending on where they're at, uh, with a, a new renewed sense of who they are mm -hmm. um, as young Native people, we will then move forward and uh, each kid will have a case manager and we'll help them achieve their goals, whether it's education, mm -hmm. gainful employment, uh, life skills, everything from banking to how to write a resume, um, with the ultimate goal, of course, obviously, for youth to uh, eventually become independent, mm -hmm. proud, and self-sufficient. I, I think uh, you are uh, the phenomenal optimist. Uh, I feel it in this optimism <laughs> in your storytelling, and it's wonderful. And I think uh, you believe, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, that there is a brilliant and responsive future ahead for uh, our children, for the children, and for the culture, and for the community. Uh, and I think that uh, it's about uh, staying true to oneself and one's identity, to insist on being oneself. Does that make sense at all? Yes, it does. And you, you know, there, you really have no choice but to stay optimistic. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the optimism is, is the fact that we see this every day. We see these kids that are struggling with homelessness come into our shelters and our transitional living, and they're just lost mm -hmm. and and um, angry and hopeless and and um, just dealing with a lot of you know trauma. And once we help them establish and turn that around, and we I mean just watching them heal and and watch them understand that okay, so this isn't my fault. This, you know, <laughs> that, you know, there is another, a mm -hmm. true meaning of mm -hmm. what it means for me mm -hmm. to be a young American Indian mm -hmm. person, um, that this isn't my fault. And so they really just turn, it just creates the platform that they need mm -hmm. to then be able to focus on what their personal goals might be. And so it's just, it's priceless. It's it's we see it every day so we know it's going to happen well listen i want to thank you for what you are doing thank you for the work the passion uh the strength uh, that you bring to the work uh, my guest deb foster executive director of Ainda young center uh, the new uh, expansion coming online in september uh, mino oski Ainda young meaning good new home, a way to help young people uh, have a safe place for cultural healing and growth. Thank you so much and continued good work. Oh, thank you and thank you for having us here. And uh, the Eng Da Young and the team at the Eng Da Young has been a big part of this. This is certainly not something I've done on my own at all. And so I just really appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk about it. Well, our goal is to tell the story. I think our job is to let our communities know that uh, great work is afoot, that people mm -hmm. operate with integrity and with um, uh, just the spirit, and that they are guided by the spirit, uh, yes. and that they're, they are succeeding as we speak, that mm -hmm. you are succeeding as we speak. And so there's confidence in that, and the model of that inspires everybody else to do better and be better to find our best selves. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland, and we'll talk to you next time. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, working to bridge the digital, digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across the Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. My guest uh, today, my guest this afternoon, uh, I'm pleased to have uh, Ruby Lee. Ruby Lee, thank you for being here. Ruby Lee is the president of Clues. Clues is a 40-year-old nonprofit organization with offices in Minneapolis and St. Paul, 
and now in Greeter, Minnesota. Since she started with the organization about six years ago, she's been able to grow the organization into a $9 million annual operating budget organization. That's huge. She has over 100 staff and will be opening the expanded headquarters building for Clues in St. Paul this summer. Through her leadership, Clues is now expanding its work into transformational Latino community development work. Uh, Ruby, thank you for being here. Thank you, Al. And so I'm intrigued mm -hmm. by this idea, the notion of transformational uh, community development. What do you mean by that? Yes, well, as, as I said earlier, the organization has been in existence since um, 1981, mm -hmm. uh, almost 40 years old, and um, we have done tremendous work around health and wellness, economic development, educational enrichment, and cultural development. As we look at all the work that we do in a um, holistic approach, we also are looking at, you know, what are the systems? What are the changes that are needed for the organization and for the community at, as a whole? Um, as we provide one-on-one -on -one services, you know, our staff has done the coaching individually. Now we're looking at a systems change in terms of um, having the ability to address issues with the city, with the county, with the state of Minnesota, um, the disparities that our communities of color and Latinos are suffering right now mm -hmm. are still very clear. And um, we're trying to figure out how can the inclus use its institutional power to make change happen. Um, in that, we also are looking at how do we deliver our services, mm -hmm. having surveying community and, and uh, patients and clients of ours to see how we can then provide a platform and interventions that are timely to help our community move into socioeconomic mobility. Clues is a legacy institution in Minnesota, in yes. Twin Cities. Uh, we've mentioned 40 years, long mm -hmm. time, yes. uh, providing great service, great leadership, great training. Uh, walk us back through the development of Clues. What is the Clues story? Sure, it's, it's a very interesting story, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because I immigrated to Minnesota in 1981 at mm -hmm. the same time the organization started. And from so, where? Uh, from Guatemala originally, okay, okay. yes. And uh, so at that time, there were only about 30,000 Latinos in the state. Mm -hmm. Today we have over 300,000. Wow. Um, so the community has grown. Exponentially. Um, exponentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly the majority of our, um, uh, of our participants are youth who have been, you know, who have grown up and been born in mm -hmm. Minnesota. So we're now working with a, a different population. 45% mm -hmm. of Latinos in Minnesota are under the age of 20. So that tells you who the workforce mm -hmm. of the state will be mm -hmm. at a time when demographically the state is having a shortage of future employees. Right. You know, there will be more jobs than employees. Mm -hmm. So um, it has evolved um, the, the need for economic integration or integration of many of the populations that have come to Minnesota who are Latino descent or Latino born. Um, has also changed, you know, in the, in the old days majority, and still Mexican Americans or Mexican uh, born individuals are the largest majority sure. of the population. We had many Puerto Ricans who established, you know, in the early 80s, mm -hmm. uh, but now you have a diverse group of Central Americans, mm -hmm. Guatemalans, Salvadorians, Ecuador, use Ecuador mm -hmm. um, and now Venezuelans, mm -hmm. Colombians. Mm -hmm. You see it in yeah. the businesses sure. that, are, that are open sure. with those flavors. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the other, for me personally, the other interesting fact is um, that when I came as an immigrant, I was an exchange student to St. Paul, um, went back home and then came back and married my, my neighbor, my mm -hmm. boyfriend at the time. Um, and so the difference that I, not the difference, but I guess the similarities that I see 30 years ago and now um, is that our community still needs a sense of belonging needs a safe place that they can trust, that they can attend to. Um, certainly faith-based organizations have been that mm -hmm. for many, um, but the nonprofits that, that we have in the community that are Latino-led and Latino-owned mm -hmm. um, certainly serve that place for many. When, when we say development, uh, what are we talking about development work? What does that mean in the Latino community and cultural experience? Sure, sure. What we're trying to do is, um, again, looking at uh, 
the community as a whole. You know, we do have the transactional services, if you may, where a coach or a staff person works individually with um, one of the clients to develop, um, for example, an economic plan, you know, a savings plan. Um, but now we're looking at, a, 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 in addition to that, we're looking at a community as a whole. So we have been delivering services in a multi-generational way so that when parents are learning, the children are also being taken care of and learning. Um, we, invest, we have been investing in the organization and looking at um, how do we then uh, engage our community as well. And, and part of that is our mission, uh, speaking about helping to build the capacity of our community to be healthier, prosperous, and engage. Three very important words. What do you think are the major challenges? Are the challenges internal? Uh, by that I mean uh, deficiencies uh, that we as individuals have, either lack of training, lack of education, uh, something that's a deficit, or are the barriers that are outside mm -hmm. equally great or greater? Uh, are there barriers that are external, that are structural, that are institutional, that uh, tend to repress and suppress the natural tendency of our communities yes. to advance and prosper? Uh, when I hear you say development, I'm envisioning uh, becoming communities that are whole, yes. healthy, yes. vital, and, and growing in every arena of human endeavor. Exactly. Am I seeing that the right way? Yes, definitely. That's exactly what we're looking at. Um, because, again, the, despair, you know, the disparity mm -hmm. gaps are, are growing. Mm -hmm. And so why is that? And how is, can so we... is it us or is it something outside of us or is it both? I think it's both. Okay. You know, I think... Um, Partially in our community, there are many opportunities that, um, that are available, but a lot of times community just, you know, they're busy working. We yeah. have families that, parents that are working three jobs. Mm -hmm. So when can they take, mm -hmm. you know, access to uh, skills building or a training and mm -hmm. a new job? Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of that um, integration or uh, learning that needs to happen where not only people need to learn about what's available for them to access, mm -hmm. but also how to do it and how to uh, think of a job, for example, as an asset mm -hmm. and not just a job. Mm -hmm. um, right now, Latinos have one of the highest labor forces in uh, market in, in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So we're working, so it's not like we need more jobs. Our families are, are working, but they're um, underpaid. Mm -hmm. So they're either underemployed or unemployed. Mm -hmm. And so at Clues, we're trying to change that by providing new skills building, providing opportunities for people to earn wages that are higher. And maybe instead of having three jobs that hire them for 15 hours, thinking about how can you get a full-time job <coughs> that is a good job. Mm -hmm. And in that meaning that they would have benefits, they livable would have wages. livable wages, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, that's just one part of it. So the socioeconomic mobility is part of what we're investing in right now. And when I say social, it means um, for us in, in the work that we're doing nowadays, um, the engagement piece. You know, how can we get communities and our folks involved in the civic engagement part of mm -hmm. the, that goes beyond just voting, mm -hmm. you know, or registering to vote. Mm -hmm. It is about taking ownership of what's happening around housing and in their community. How is that impacting their livelihood? How are they, their children's education um, something that they need to incorporate themselves in and really have a voice at mm -hmm. the school system? Um, so those are the new venues that mm -hmm. we're seeking to engage in um, while uh, providing the spaces where people feel safe, where the agenda is their agenda mm -hmm. and not imposed on them. Mm -hmm. Um, where the counties are engaged in the conversation and not just, you know, driven by the county, for example, or driven by um, another uh, institutional group that think that same all, same all, or, or put all of our communities, especially communities of color, kind of on the same boat when it's culturally there are differences mm -hmm. that need to be tailored to, to the issues of our communities. I have said and I say often that uh, we're in an arena where we have a, a, a need to declare that culture is an asset, mm -hmm. not a liability, exactly. that the old model uh, asked us to believe that our culture was a deficit, yes. that we uh, were standing on or in or that we brought to the table, but we are demonstrating 
that know uh, our cultural sensibility uh, is rich, strong, vital, engaged, and engaging, and that this brings us to the table with gifts, yes. right? Yes. And so we present ourselves in culture as an asset for the development of community uh, and of, of the nation. Yes. And I think that's a different point of view, and it's one that empowers yes. our communities of color yes. to speak our own truth. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I very much agree with what we just you just said. Um, not only you know culture is, is innate in in us as part of our strength, uh, you know, as an asset, but it's part of who we are and what makes us stronger. Mm -hmm. But also the narratives, I think, and that's what we're committed to do at Clues, mm -hmm. to help change the narratives. When our young people are hearing a lot of anti-immigrant mm -hmm. messages, a lot of um, labels that are so negative. Um, we all need, as, a, as Minnesotans and, and as a country, we need to provide the, you know, counter-arrest those comments right. and, and make them positive and really um, assist others to, to really um, enrich, you know, the, life, the lives of all of us uh, through their culture, through their beliefs. Um, and so the investment in, in culture for us is key. It's really important. Uh, the expansion of our building in St. Paul will be cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. We're working with the city of St. Paul, for example, to have a district that is very Latino mm -hmm. uh, driven, uh, not only by the businesses, but eventually through murals, mm -hmm. through art mm -hmm. um, that are displayed in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, on Lake Street, you know, in Minneapolis, for example, um, that has happened over the years as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so the participation of government institutions and others is key to the progress of this, this community development that goes beyond one-on-one -on -one services. We, we started off talking about uh, your uh, entry into the community as an exchange student. I want to focus for the last couple of minutes on, on you and your vision and your leadership. Uh, how have you come to this work? Uh, what uh, focused you on pursuing the uh, work that you've done so uh, wonderfully with uh, in the past uh, six years, but beyond that as well? Certainly. Well, what, what drives you? Um, culture. Culture. <laughs> what you, you just said. What you just said. Um, you know, I, I've, uh, I have the fortune to, to have wonderful jobs in Minnesota and, and be in that professional field for 38 years. Spent about 18 years of my professional life in philanthropy mm -hmm. and really appreciating how Minnesota evolved, you know, in the 80s and the 90s mm -hmm. when we had an influx of um, the Hmong community, or, or, you know, uh, Southeast Asian community mm -hmm. and African communities that moved into the state. And, um, as a program officer, or as a director in philanthropy, was able to support a lot of arts and cultural and immigration and immigrant programming that not only enriched our state, but really provided a lot of um, economic progress. So personally for me, um, when I came, uh, you know, he helping people understand my own community, my culture, um, using the arts as a, as a nice way to educate and to share, in, in a non-controversial way um, has been proof of um, the work that I've done with young Latinas and young people in particular so that they can be proud of who they are. Uh, so I think throughout that has been my passion, mm -hmm. my effort with my own children and, and many kids that now are grown up parents mm -hmm. who now they're passing it on to and their you're children. you're a grandmother, right? I just became a grandmother. Well, yes, very happy to, to have that. Thank so you. what what did uh, your mom and your dad hope for you when you were three, five, seven, and uh, they looked at their baby girl? What were they thinking? What do you think they were hoping and dreaming for you? Ooh, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> but um, something that I've always shared, especially as it affects, um, impacts Latina women or Latina girls, uh, was that I know, I remember growing up trying to uh, talk about uh, international relations, which is what I wanted to do. And my father said, that's not a job for a woman. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a limitation that was put on me mm -hmm. at an early on age. And lo and behold, uh, that's kind of what I do now. You know, I look at um, obviously international uh, connections, mm -hmm. but also uh, in the work that we do with Clues, mm -hmm. just being able to advance the culture, advance the community. Um, I know that having a strong role model in my mother was, was mm -hmm. you know, important. And I had that to help me push for other women to step up and 
and really be their own person. Final question, what is uh, your hope and expectation for all Minnesotans? Uh, I think we agree that this is a wonderful place. It's a great state. The people are good people, but still there are problems, and the problems are evident in this huge set of disparities that disadvantage or reflect the disadvantage people of color experience. And uh, I think that there are some uh, either uh, sort of cultural and institutional and not, not uh, wicked bias, but biases nonetheless that have a wicked impact mm -hmm. on people mm -hmm. that want to be good people and provide value as neighbors and friends and citizens as, and workers that we think our communities represent. So what's our message to Minnesota in general? How do we help Minnesota become the best Minnesota it can be yes. for every Minnesotan? Yes. What do yes. you think? I think what for me it's um, taking action. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, it's individual action. Each of us can help um, the systems be better, the state be better, the connections be better. Um, at CLUES, we have over 700 volunteers cool. who are primarily non-Latino sure. who help us do our work. Mm -hmm. Without them, you know, we couldn't mm -hmm. do the work mm -hmm. and serve, you know, 15,000, 20,000 people a year. Um, but I think in systems, you know, that's where I believe that, um, you know, each person as we are evolving as a community and what we were called minorities before we're becoming the majority, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's happening mm -hmm. uh, as we speak. Mm -hmm. So um, really thinking about how can we then help transform the, the systems and um, not, again, not use a one size fits all. Mm -hmm and be able to open doors and opportunities for our communities of color to be active participants in systems. Ruby Lee, thank you so very much. You, Ruby Lee is the president of CLUES, CLUES 40-year-old legacy institution serving Latino communities in Minneapolis and St. Paul and now in greater Minnesota as well. Thank you so much, continued success in all your work. Thanks to Comcast for supporting you and supporting this broadcast as yes. well. I'm Al McFarland, we'll see you next time. Support for Conversations with Al McFarland was provided by Old National Bank, Comcast, Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance, and North American Banking Company.